Prison Time Consulting, Keep Love the People, Communities Method, and today we are here with Charlotte Laws. This is probably the last interview I thought I'd be doing about a month ago, so it's uh, we're crazy on paper <laughs> now. Um, Charlotte, how are you doing today? Thank you for joining us. I'm doing fine, and thank you for having me. And of course, uh, you're, you're welcome for joining me. Thank you. For people that, that don't know, Charlotte Laws is pretty much kind of the, the person that is known responsible for single-handedly kind of defeating, taking down the uh, the Hunter Moore, is anyone up yet, dot com, and the Netflix series, The Most Hated Man on the Internet, which is kind of how this interview all came about. Um, before we get into that, though, uh, this isn't your first time kind of being involved in media. You kind of, your entire life has kind of been through a pretty impressive string of events of uh, crashing parties, uh, famous, like, parties, <laughs> correct? That's true. <laughs> So tell, tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got to be where you are today. Um, well, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and I went to various colleges and ended up getting a PhD from USC in social ethics. And I was a single mom and raised my daughter and then married my husband. And um, I have uh, six chickens and two dogs. They're all uh, rescues. So I'm very interested in animal rights as well and protecting other living beings. And I write books and I've had many, many different occupations. I was actually a BBC commentator as recently as a year ago and I was on an NBC show as a commentator called The Filter when all this happened with Hunter. So that was kind of one of my jobs anyway at that time. I was also in politics, local politics in LA on a local council called the Greater Valley Glen Council. So I've had like over 35 different jobs and I've tried all this, all sorts of crazy things in my life. <laughs> yeah, you've got quite the track record there. Now you're, you're married now to your, your husband. You guys have been married for how long? We met on the night of the earthquake in 1994. That was our first date. And we got married in 1999. Because it took him a long time to agree to marry me. <laughs> well, you, you, you pursued him? Yeah, I did. I made very fast decisions. So I, I cared about very few men in my life, but I make a decision like pretty much the first day and, and that's that's it, you know. So when you know, you know. When you know, you know. <laughs> and and just one one child, one daughter? Yes, one daughter. Okay. Um, have you always been like because what you accomplished and we'll kinda we'll jump back and forth a little bit, but what you accomplished with going after Hunter, um I, I'm not going to lie, you know, because you, as a prison consultant, I deal with a lot of individuals that, that make mistakes, that go through issues, that 99% of them seem to take accountability at some point. So when I originally was reached out uh, to by Hunter back in 2015, 16, um, it was him and his mother that were reaching out to me. And his mother was always very pleasant, very, she seemed very aware of uh, wanting to, to do what's best for her son, but I'm not sure if she was maybe naive to the situation of what Hunter was doing or if she was turning a blind eye, uh, because Hunter also was very compelling and, you know, he, he admitted a little bit about how he got in over his head and things went too fast, but he was always very adamant about nothing to do with any of the hacking. And he ended up taking a plea deal because it was just gonna get dragged out. And I know that in the federal system, you know, a lot of people will take a plea deal because if you don't, even people that didn't quite do what the government said they did, it's mm -hmm. usually in their best interest to plea out or else you're going to get potentially slaughtered. So there was, you know, there was the understanding, the ability of, uh, of maybe what Hunter was saying had, had some truth to it. Um, but for you, it's completely different because, you know, you were the mother of your daughter and you had to take your daughter's word that she didn't submit these photos anywhere. And probably 99% of the world didn't believe it until it was proven. So what was that like going through that, trying to prove that, not just to get Hunter in trouble, but to, to show that your daughter wasn't sending, you know, nude photos through the Internet? Yeah, I mean, victim blaming was prominent back then. It was before the Me Too movement. And pretty much everybody was attacking me and people were attacking my daughter. And they were calling her a slut and they were saying, you know, we know you send it out to thousands of guys. And, and they were saying that I just was blind to the fact that my, you know, my daughter's behavior. But I mean, I knew from the first second I talked to her that she hadn't sent the picture because I know my daughter and she's very conservative and she wouldn't have sent the picture. 
But the truth is, I believe people should have a right to take their own picture, and it should not be distributed by other people against their will. Right. So, you know. And even for the people, like, because, you know, obviously there was there were some people on the website that did submit or get submitted or whatever. Oh, yeah. Because maybe they sent a, a, a picture to a boyfriend or girlfriend. Um, even if Hunter hadn't hacked, because there's another guy out there, I can't think of his name right now. He, he, he's trying to reach out to me, and, and I'm trying to... The guy seems a little bit off his rockers. I'm trying to stay away from it. But let's say Hunter wasn't hacking and it was just the website. It's still, you know, if, if my daughter, like I have daughters, if my daughter sent her boyfriend a picture, which I hope she wouldn't, I still wouldn't think that's a slutty thing to do. It's something that you're sending to somebody that you, you have this illusion of it's a private moment. And then somebody exploits the loopholes in the law and creates a website. Well, I'm not the one posting it. I'm just hosting a website and, Sorry, I'm not going to take it down. Um, so even the women that did get submitted to these websites because they sent their picture, it's easy to go back and say, "Oh yeah, you were so stupid. What were you doing?" But clearly, it, it's the 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 event wasn't like that. Um, well, also, you know, you, you have to remember everybody keeps saying, "Oh well, he wasn't doing anything illegal." He actually was doing something illegal because he was violating copyright law, and. You know, you can actually criminally prosecute copyright law. It doesn't happen often. It's usually a civil case. And the victim can win up to $250,000 per photo. And my daughter not only had that topless picture on his site, but he ha she had other closed pictures that were her copyrights that she owned that were uploaded to that site. And right. Hunter was re refusing to remove copyrighted material. So he wasn't, like, not breaking the law. He was right. breaking the law. He just, there was no revenge porn law at that time. And is re now, is, re is, re is the revenge porn law, is it everywhere, or is it still kind of being delegated out to different areas? Because it's not federal yet, right? It's still on a state. It's not federal, state. but it's in every state except South Carolina. Okay. And, you know, we're still trying to get a federal law passed, but it doesn't look like it's going to pass. Um, so there's only about a 4% chance, according to Jackie Spear, that it's going to go through. And it's you know been an uphill battle. It's just really really hard to get something passed, primarily because the ACLU has been against it. You know he really does a good job of uh, of pretending to be somebody that isn't affected by it, like he just plays like the tough guy constantly when he's online or like nothing nothing gets to him. But when I would talk to him, he would there was these moments where he's. He's like scared of his own shadow to go outside. And I was like, Hunter, why don't you show this side to people? Um, and he just, I don't know if it's because it really wasn't him or if there's something really broken inside of him or if he feels like without these these trolls that he kind of commands on these like uh, undergrounding websites that it's more important to have their, it's more important for them to like him than it is for him to, to stop it all together. Because he talks about in the videos he said one of the biggest addictions is is being addicted to this fame, but it's it, it's a very very ugly kind of fame. Um, when he was supposed to come here for the interviews that I did with him, those those three interviews, they were supposed to be here in the studio. And here's the so I bought him a ticket, we got him all set up, and I'm glad he didn't come now. He's trying to be kind of a different person than I thought. But if you look at here, let me share this here. So this was a, a text message the night before he was supposed to come. I don't know if you guys can see this. It's too small for me. Oh, that's so, better. On July 24th, it was 10 o'clock my time. I'm East Coast. He's West Coast. So I just sent him a text right before I was going to sleep. I said, text me when you're bored. I'll check your flight in the a.m. to see where he's at. He sent me a text. I will for sure. 12.40 a.m. Hey, bro, I'm just going to send you the money back for the flight. They pushed it back again. I'm afraid to check my bags because I won't get my clothes. I can do a Zoom or something, but I don't want to be stuck in the airport all day. And be tired as fuck let me know i didn't see that one because i was sleeping 2 15 he sent me another one i'm sorry bro legit having mental breakdowns over this documentary and stress beyond belief i'm really sorry um you know and i was i woke up and saw that and obviously i was kind of kind of frustrated by it because it's like dude you know spent all this money to get you here and then then just flake like this uh which kind of tell me that that this is he's trying to act like he's not being affected by this and it's and it's playing no i i think it is like I, I'm, I do feel like he's completely afraid to like leave his house, which he should be, um, because of what he, what he did. And going into how you were able to go after him, and you were getting threats and faxes, you know, watching the Netflix documentary, it 
it kind of, because I didn't see the documentary until after I did the second episode with him, because it, it had just come out like 3 o'clock that morning. It came out midnight, East uh, West Coast time. Um, watching the documentary, I watched all three of them back to back, and I was, I said to myself, there's no way that this documentary can be completely full of shit, because they would be opening themselves up for all kind of defamation if they were just making this stuff up. Um, that's when I started getting access to the, to the documentation. So what was it like? going through the process of getting your voice heard because the cops were turning you down. Nobody wanted to look into it. It was just like, yeah, this dumb girl sent her pictures and now she's mad. Uh, that was kind of the approach that people were looking at it. Yeah. I mean, it was an uphill battle and it's true. The cops, you know, did the victim blaming and, um, you know, the media were glorifying Hunter. They were giving him the big headline, the big headlines. They were putting his picture everywhere. He was eating it up. He loved getting that, uh, feature in Rolling Stone. He loved being on Anderson Cooper. He loved, you know, getting all that attention. And, you know, as he says, he had a God complex. I completely agree with that. I still think he's very arrogant. He was arrogant in court. He's never apologized. And he told you he would do, the only thing he would change is he would ratchet it up 10 times harder, which I don't know what that means, except perhaps cause murders. I have no idea what that means. Well, we're uh, definitely, the, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. So, yeah, so, I mean, he hasn't grown up, he hasn't learned his lesson, and it's very sad because, you know, I always say he's a charismatic leader, and he's like Charles Manson. He's able to draw a crowd. He's able to get people to do what he wants to do, and that's a talent, and it's a shame he doesn't use that for good. Instead, he uses that to make people miserable, and it's sad that he does that. I mean, he really, I think it would be great if he turned his life around and realized, hey, I could do positive things because people are drawn to me. Yeah, you know, that, I was talking to, uh, I think you know Amanda as well, Amanda, the, um, yeah. yes, talking to her last night, and she actually wants to do an interview with me uh, to come on here, but I'm, I, I, I'm not sure if she's really ready to share that kind of a story yet, because there's there's a level of accountability she, she needs to work on, too, before she can come on here and do that, but I've actually got some clips here, I've got like five or six clips that I'd love to, to play, and then kind of get a response from you on these clips, is that okay? Sure. Okay, so it's first one, here we go. It's a little difficult situation because I, I did my time and um, I'm not so much worried about myself. I'm more just worried about, you know, like my immediate friends and family having to deal with this stuff all over again. And that's pretty much, that's pretty much my, the only negative, I guess. So hearing that, what are your comments on that first one there? Because that's a lot of people commented on that, that he only cares about his personal friends and family. Well, you know, I mean, I mean, I, I assume he's telling the truth there. I mean, I never know whether to believe him, to be honest, because he says so many things that are false. But, you know, I mean, I think it's a shame he didn't do the documentary. I mean, I'm glad he didn't do the documentary because I think the slant would have been very different and it would have given him that notoriety again and it would have given him a boost in being the bad boy again. But I think it was stupid for him not to do it because he would have been able to put his perspective out there. And I also think it's stupid that he hasn't repented and he hasn't said, I'm so sorry. This is a very forgiving country. A certain segment of the population would say, oh, Hunter, okay, I forgive you. You've changed. And so I think it's just bad PR, the fact that he's continuing the way he is. So it surprises me, to be honest. Yeah, see, I... I... I agree with you, but I have a slight different view of it. I think the reason why Hunter didn't do, well, the reason why he hasn't done any interviews isn't because for any reason other than, if he would have went on the documentary, there would have been nothing, there would have been no angle that he could have done that would have other other than taken accountability. Because right. there's nothing he could, there's, there's no, that's the reason why he wants it, like even during the interviews I did with him about you guys, he didn't want to talk about you. He didn't want to talk about your daughter. He, because bringing that up, there's nowhere to go with it because it's it, it all leads to there's only one answer. And you knew what you were doing and you were fucking just trying to destroy people's lives. Um, and he's not ready to admit that yet because admitting that, and this kind of ties in Amanda. You know, we know Amanda was a was a big supporter of his for, for a decade um, to a point where they started to kind of have slight maybe feelings or at least she thought that's what it was. She honestly thought that Hunter viewed her different than he viewed everybody else. She thought Hunter had her back because whenever they would talk behind closed doors, he would always kind of, you know, 
sweet talk, nice guy. But the minute people started bashing Amanda on the Discord and she was asking Hunter, Hunter to rectify it, he just wouldn't. He just kind of went silent and kind of showed her that that's all that's important to him is to have these little mindless, trolly, rink-a-dinky, and they're probably all fake people. None of them are using their real names. None of them are using their real names. It's just a probably bunch of drift. Yeah. Probably right. <laughs> and that was the first time that she kind of opened her eyes to it and saw for what it really is and saw, you know, we all have some kind of damage or hurt that's happened into our lives. And I can only imagine somebody that would, uh, would attach themselves to Hunter and, and look past all the negative things are seeing what they want to see because think about it they were they were not living in the same state uh it was a safe relationship for her she it was just it gave her this ability to it's like a lot of the prison wives that we deal with that go through these their husbands are in prison for life and it's never going to be a real relationship but they've been through so many damaging relationships that this for them is comfortable and safe um it took her a long time to come out of that because right before i did the interview with him i spoke to her and she was still, you know, very, very much on the Hunter support bandwagon. And now she's getting spam calls and emails are getting blown up and she's getting harassed. You know, it's exactly what happened to all these other women are now happening to her. And it's unfortunate. Um, but I'm going to show another clip here. And I'm, uh, we got a few of them. I, I want to get to before the before we wrap up here. because Some of these are interesting. Clip two. So before we did the interview, I had you talk to... Uh, Amanda, she had ran my fan page the whole time. And you got to understand, like, the website, like, this whole narration of what the website uh, was today, because it's been controlled by all these green haired goblins. But, you know, and all, you know, it's all about clickbait and pushing traffic and all that stuff. And they control the narrative. Um, but, you know, my parents, everybody was so supportive of everything because it wasn't that like it was just this funny hilarious website and that had this funny crazy quirky community and it wasn't anything malicious then or you know i'm not justifying saying that nobody was hurt or anything like that i'm just saying like for the time and what it actually was it was like wow everyone was like proud of me to be honest with you so that part of the interview i was, I was at because I, I still to this day he tells me that the site was never intended for what happened. But when I asked him what the site's initial intent was, he kept kind of summarizing that it was something for bands, but he couldn't really explain it. And then he was like, here, talk to Amanda. She'll explain it to you. Um, do you feel like he just runs in circles and doesn't really have any direction with what he's trying to answer? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I, I don't think he tells the truth very often to be perfectly honest. And, you know, what I understand, it was, you know, a lot of these band people were initially being put up against their will. I mean, they didn't want to be on the site, and they were very upset about being on the site. Um, if it had just been consensual from the beginning and it stayed that way, and it was just a regular pornography site where everybody signed off on it, self-submitted, and that's all it was, then he would probably still be running it today. It would just be a regular porn site, but... You know, that's not what it was. And I don't think that's what it was at the beginning because that's why he got stabbed with the pen supposedly by that girl. It's because he put her picture up at the beginning many a long time ago without her consent. So I think it was always kind of like that. Yeah, it, it, and it really kind of seems like because he couldn't give an answer for anything of value that the site did. Uh, and he kept talking about... It, it, Everything that he mentioned during his interview or even prior to his interview, I did an interview with him a couple of years ago while he was still on federal probation. And he was a little a little bit more withholding at that point. He wasn't so speaking the same way he does now. I think he's maybe afraid of this violation or potential. Um, you know he did RDAP, right? The Residential Drug Abuse Program. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, I think I, think I knew that, yeah. Which really blows my mind because I did RDAP in federal prison. And, and it's, it's very hard to get through RDAP Faking it, you know, when you start talking about taking accountability and focusing on consequences, um, to see where his mindset is now and to see that he went through this program, because it did not time off of the sentence. That's why he ended up serving quite a bit less than what he was initially sentenced to. Uh, it, it's, it's mind-blowing that he still is living in this fantasy world where he wants people to see him in this godlike complex, but I don't... Do you, I don't. I think he wants it to be the way it used to be, and it's never going to be like that again. 
Yeah, um, he's stuck in 2012. He's like a dinosaur, and he's stuck in 2012. A that's a good one. He's and he's so he's like the youngest dinosaur ever. <laughs> so what was the pivotal? What was the turning point when you were going after Hunter? Where did you at some point feel like this is this is never going to get rectified? No one is ever going to hear us. Well, I mean, I kind of felt like I was making progress most of the time. I did get worried when it came to the point where he was going to bring the site back and he said it's going to be worse. He was going to put the victim's address. He was going to upload all the same content because he still had control of that content. He was going to put the address and driving directions how to get to their houses. And I thought the FBI had dropped the investigation at that point. And I think he did too. And that's why he got so bold because the FBI hadn't been returning my calls for a while at that point. And so I was feeling concerned until Anonymous came in and scared the crap out of him. <laughs> and then he became very silent after Anonymous talked him. So he was afraid of the FBI. He was afraid of Anonymous. He was never afraid of me. Yeah, Anonymous, he, to, on all the interviews, he said none of that ever happened. They didn't, they didn't, because I, I mean, on the, oh, I know it happened because I saw the social security number and the stuff online. So I death know certificate. It there's a death certificate with him. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't see that, but I think it's hilarious. <laughs> it I hope it's true because it's really funny. <laughs> but yeah, he didn't want to admit that any of that happened. Um, and we asked him, uh, it's one of these clips, because we're at, I was really trying to get a strong definition of what trolling was. And as he described it, I really don't see that there's a different definition between trolling and bullying. I don't really see how they separate. It seems like they're kind of one and the same. Mm -hmm. uh, and now what you did, we'll call that, we'll, we'll give that the definition of trolling. Because you didn't personally troll, but you pressed so hard on this that what, what was it that broke that finally made them look into this a little bit deeper than, all right, maybe your daughter is not some just lying idiot. Maybe this really did happen. Well, I had, you know, I had reached out yeah. to victims on his site and it was very hard contacting them because I didn't want to use electronics because I was scared the hacker might be on their email or social media. So everything had to be done by phone. And it was really hard because sometimes I would have to just look at their last name see the city they lived in, and then call somebody with the same last name and say, are you related to this person? Could you have her call me? So I reached out to about 40 people, and I found out 40% of them said they had been hacked. And I even was able to find out that the same hacker who hacked my daughter had also hacked some of these other people. So when the FBI came to my house, at that point I had a 12-inch file, and I had names, emails, phone numbers for other hacked victims besides my daughter. And I was able to hand that over and hopefully that helped because when they walked through the door, they said there was a very slim chance they'd be able to take the case because they normally only took cases where there was a loss of a lot of money. Right. And um, obviously we didn't have that. And they also told me it can take over a year or it usually takes over a year to complete an investigation. So it was a very long process. So I was really happy when they agreed to take the case. And I think that, you know, I, and I, don't, I don't know if this is not confirmed, but I, I heard that the lead agent, Jeff Kirkpatrick, who was in the documentary, actually kind of talked the FBI into taking this case. So I think we can possibly credit him with, you know, having that move forward. Yeah, you know, um, the hacking, because everybody, when you hear hacking, you know, you picture some guy like sitting in his house, like typing code. And, and really, even, even the hacker was kind of a fucking idiot, to be honest, because <laughs> it was it was like, grade school hacking when you when we found out what they yeah. did what they would do is they would send like a, a, a message through facebook and say hey i got locked out of my account i can't get into my phone can i send the message to your phone and you give me the code and you think it's your friend sending you this and you're like oh yeah sure so like i would send you a message through facebook and you would get the code and then you give me the code not knowing it's getting into your facebook so now i hack into your facebook and while i'm in there you all of a sudden you realize you're locked out of your facebook so I know you're going to get access to your Facebook again, but I add a secondary email that you don't know about. Mm -hmm. But this idiot used the same secondary email <laughs> for everybody. So when you hand this over to the FBI, they had to go, oh, it's kind of like you, <laughs> you can give credit to whoever you want. But if, 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 if this hacker had been even this much 
of a, if his brain were like an inch bigger than the peanut size it already was, I believe that uh, they probably the feds probably wouldn't have gone after it because it was, still would have been too much legwork for them to tie it all together. But having the same email with people spread all over the fucking United States, it made it almost. They probably would have been some kind of a liability issue if they hadn't taken the case at that point. So you really helped. I would say more than help. You put the case together, and then they shut you down because they didn't want you to mess up their case. That's probably why they weren't returning your calls. Uh, well, he did return my calls for a really long time, and, and, and like, and I talked to him probably at least like three times a week. I mean, I really talked to them a lot, and I could kind of read behind, you know, between the lines as far as what they were doing. Even though he would always say, "I can't tell you what's going on. I can't tell what we're doing," but I always kind of had an idea what they were doing. And the hacker actually, even after he was raided. He kept hacking. They couldn't believe it. I mean, here the guy's raided. He's under federal investigation. He's still hacking. I mean, he went into like, I don't remember, like 500 more accounts or something before he was actually arrested. So it was really, really bizarre, actually. But you know how he found Hunter is he hacked Hunter. He hacked Hunter. Right. And And, and and instead of Hunter getting upset, he said, hey, you want to hack for me? I'll pay you. And that's how they came to know each other. Yeah, and Hunter's like, I didn't even know the guy. I never met him. Yeah, well, he probably so, never met him. He probably exactly. He's him. playing with fucking words. I could say that yeah. basically. I don't know who Hunter is. I never met him. Yeah. Because I've never shook his hand. Um, right. But yeah, but he, he damn now damn well knew who the guy was. Uh, you know, let's jump to, we got another clip here. This is clip number three. Flat out no. First of all, uh, uh, I, I mean, this probably sounds horrible, but I'm proud of what I created. I'm proud of the community that I created. Now, how do I wish I would have gone about it in a different way? A hundred percent. And, you know, I'm obviously more than sorry for, and I definitely would love to apologize to people that were affected negatively by the website. Um, but besides that, you know, like I did do my time. Like, I feel like I did pay my dues. Um, and it, it wasn't all negative, and I had a great time, and I would definitely do it over and over again. So, so he says he would apologize to the victims. He's, it's almost, the way he says it there, it's almost like he's not allowed to apologize to him or something. <laughs> At any moment, he could jump on the internet and say, hey, this is Hunter Moore, and what I did was wrong. I want to apologize, but that's never happened, has it? it, it was, no. Now I heard the uh, the the co-defendant did apologize in court. He did actually in court. He turned around and apologized to Kayla. And Hunter, what, what was what did Hunter do in court? He was very arrogant in court. He um, he pretty much his parents and him ignored us. I mean, he gave me like a, a kind of an arrogant look at the beginning, and then he never looked at me again. And his attorney whispered to him, "Is that the lady back there in the green?" And I was wearing a green jacket, and I overheard that, and Kayla did too. And she said, oh, mom, they're talking about you. And I said, I know. But his parents and him, they never looked back. I was really quite amazed at the willpower it took not to look back because I would have been so curious if I had been in their position. But um, so, yeah, I mean, it was um, he never apologized and he didn't seem remorseful in the least. And I don't believe he is to this day. No, when he talks about like, I wish I, I when he's, the thing is, he would say these things like, I'm sorry for what I did, but doesn't say what he's sorry for. I wish I had done things differently, but doesn't say what he wishes he had done differently. It's like these very kind of empty, soulless statements that he makes that that sound good for a minute, but then he'll completely contradict it with like the very next words that diarrhea out of his mouth. Uh, it, it was hard doing the interview because I, I I wasn't expecting Saint Hunter to show up, but I wasn't expecting Satan Hunter to show up either. <laughs> I was expecting kind of like somebody that had grown up 10 years later and been like, you know, I made a lot of dumb mistakes when I was younger. You know, I wish I'd done a lot of that stuff. I can't undo it. That's why I've been living underground for the last, the last decade. But there was none of that. It was more like when he's on camera, he's, he's, he's feels like he's got to defend this egotistical prick that might at one point actually been a character. I think the character kind of consumed him. And, and if there is, a hunter in there with a heart and a soul and remorse and and empathy it's so shoved down that i don't think he knows how to how to bring it out because just like you said earlier um 
And uh, Hunter, if you're watching, which I know you'll never admit that you're watching this right now, but <laughs> you are. He's probably uh, watching. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he is. And <laughs> and the message I would say to him is like at any at any moment when you're ready to do the right thing or even try to do the right thing, uh, you know what it's like to bully people. You know what it's like to ruin people's lives. You know what it's like to just fucking drag people through the mud. You you know what it's like to to threaten them with, you know, stick the cell phone up your ass and make it vibrate if you want me to take pictures down of your child. You know what it's like to do all of those things to somebody, which means you'd be the perfect person to turn that around and advocate for that because kind of like uh, Catch Me If You Can with, uh, I can't think of the guy's name, but went out there and forced all these checks and turned around working for the FBI. Because Abigail. Frank, Frank, Frank Abigail. Abigail. Um, you could be the Frank Abagnale of, of disgusting revenge porn. And earn a level of respect from it by by being a a success story from you know turning the whole lemons into lemonade but i think he's so afraid of making that shift and cutting all of his worthless wormy i just the, the disgusting people that that care about him he's worried about how they're going to feel and not have anybody it's got to be a pretty lonely life for that to be the people that you require something from like that's the people that are giving him what he feels what he needs but, to feel but i really wonder how many i wonder how many of those people exist because honestly i've been contacted by a lot of his former followers who apologize who say i don't know what came over me i don't know why i was following him i mean i've really been contacted by a lot of people and also when he went to when he was arrested the comments online changed a hundred percent i mean they were very supportive of me whereas they had been attacking me before so there was a really a big change even back then with a lot of his followers. So I'm not sure who these people are. There can't be that many of them left. Who oh, there's a lot. There's a lot. I, really? I, sat, I sat in this Discord before he... I didn't even try to hide it. I went into the Discord under Art at Bam. Um, I sat in the Discord for about a week. And I, I've got right now probably about 50 hours of the Discord recorded. And I could go in there and do searches for, for just things that Hunter said or mentions at Hunter or Hunter mentioning at somebody else. And oh my God, Charlotte, it, it, it's, this is stuff that he's doing now. Just, it's, I mean, it's nothing illegal that he's in there doing, but it's right. so just disgustingly raunchy. And the people that are in there, now some of these people, they could be doctors or lawyers, attorneys that are living a, you know, it's like a, Somebody that looks at porn and doesn't want anybody to know about it. They go on there, they have a fake name, and but really what they're doing is they're tro oh Hunter, did you see the video? They how Hunter talks about trolling, and we'll see in a minute when he describes trolling. Um, it's basically what people are doing to him. They're putting stuff out there trying to get a reaction out of him because as much as they pretend to love him, they're they're like, man, let's watch Hunter fucking crash and burn all over again because he did it to himself. Nobody did this to him. Uh, how many yeah. people are in the Discord with him about? Oh, you know how many? Uh, Amanda, how many people are in the Discord with Hunter at any given time? She's in here watching us right now, by the way. She's uh, she's in the chat. Um, I, I know it's hundreds. Uh, hundreds are in the Discord at any given time. But but uh, Amanda's going to comment here in a second. I'll get you an exact number on there. Um, and well, she's looking that up here. I think that might be the actual the next clip here. Let's let's look at this clip. Clip number four. Um, if there was any regrets, is that I didn't go 10 times harder. That's probably my only regret, to be honest. If I'm being, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not here to cry or whatever. I've done my time. Like, obviously these people were affected by the site and I feel bad for it, for them. And they obviously need a, uh, you know, to air their grievances. But at the other day I did my time. You guys <laughs> wrote and did all this the stuff about me and my fans and all these lies. So like, um, but I had a great time. I don't, I'm not going to regret any, I don't regret anything. And, uh, I wish I went 10 times harder because the outcome would have been the same. So Amanda, actually, I think the, the very next, we're going to watch one more there. Uh, that was four. I think this is the one I wanted to see. Five. Here's the thing, you kind of have to go back in time. There's like a greater context to all this stuff. First of all, I don't even know my co-defendant. And they could, like I told you before in my previous interviews, they were trying to get me, they were trying to say, they were taking our servers, they were trying to do anything they could to take me down. 
my co-defendant. I don't even remember his name until you just said it right now because I don't know him. He was befriended by a friend of mine's cousin who worked for me because he went to SDSU. We used to go to clubs and we'd buy pictures from everybody, DJs, celebrities, all kinds of stuff because nudes were the commodity. So for me, you know, my uh, uh, my ex-employee, we all that's just what we did, man. We were just stupid 20-year-old kids. Um, as far as them being hacked, I didn't know they were being hacked until later. That's where the conspiracy came in, is because I didn't report it. I was just like, all right, whatever, this is weird. Let's just keep, let's kick, let's kick rocks, let's keep it going. And uh, that's how they got me on a conspiracy charge. All my charges are my co-defendants' charges. That's why it's a conspiracy. Okay, so two things about what he said there, which I'm gonna, I while he's bringing that up. We've got right here, we've got the indictment, guys. So this is the indictment. It's public information. Um, I will drop a link in here in a few minutes, so you guys, if you want to get the indictment. But if you look at the indictment, this is page five of the indictment on line number two. Moore sent to defendant Evans an email stating that they needed to create a new email account and delete evidence of the hacking scheme. There are statements like this through the entire fucking indictment, and how he said that he was on his co-defendant's indictment and it wasn't his indictment. Anybody that doesn't know how the federal government works, if you look at an indictment, if you look right here at the very top, United States of America plaintiff versus Hunter Moore and Charles Evans. Whoever's listed at the top of the indictment is the target of the indictment. Everybody underneath it is secondary, third, whatever. So Hunter was the focus of the indictment. So Hunter, it was your indictment that Evans was on, not the other way around. <laughs> and these are, so... This is what really kind of uh, what grinded my gears on the whole thing because when I originally spoke to Hunter, the way he had explained it, it, it really did sound like he was just some idiot that that accidentally tripped over a website at the right time and the right and things just kind of fell into place for him and it got out of hand because clearly he was out of his fucking league. There's no question. He did not have the ability to to do it the right way or else he wouldn't have, wouldn't have been such an easy paper trail to lead back to him. But when he just kept lying and just playing this innocent poor little oh man they just responded can you see that on the screen wow 694 wow yep yep that's up right now so so i mean there may be a lot of media people and people like you on there just watching to see what the heck is going on so you yeah, gotta see that yep. there's several I, hundred of those probably <laughs> i really so people kept asking me about oh what's his discord and, and i was like i don't want to promote that shit. i don't want people to know about it but i feel like if there's more people out there that are that are wanting to see it go down, I feel like everybody should go get into his Discord and start screenshotting stuff and sharing it because it, it's not just funny, gross things. It's it's racist. It's the de, it's demoralizing towards gay people, towards women, um, towards fat people. I mean, it's just it makes right now if it's a if it's a character Hunter's playing. Hunter is playing the character of a disgusting pig. Um, that's that's the character that he has. And I think if Hunter knows that there's spies in his Discord, he's really just a, a bitch, a coward, that will... <laughs> he will go hide. He will. He'll go and hide. Because if that stuff gets out, and his mom starts getting messages, and his mom starts getting emails about, look at what a disgusting child you're raising... Um, because he's acting like a child. So I think people should get, get into the Discord, personally, and take screenshots. But uh, but yeah, the the indictment is, it's, the indictment's not, people that don't understand might think, well, maybe the feds just said that. These are emails that were that were gathered. And Hunter, Hunter chalked it up to, well, I had all these employees. You didn't have any employees. It was you and some hacker and probably a couple little trolley kids that would come sit in your living room and, you know, <laughs> do cocaine with you and talk about what a, what a god you are um it's it's flabbergasting but yeah. let's get back to what you got going on and how and how your life has changed since you brought hunter down to his knees well i mean i've talked to over 500 victims to date over the past 10 years wow. so i've really been counseling a lot of people just because i have some expertise with the subject and because a lot of them don't have anyone to talk to and um so and you know it's uh it's like being a suicide hotline it's really really hard talking to these victims because you know they feel so distraught and so violated and so humiliated 
And um, supposedly, there's still 3,000 revenge porn websites online in the world today. So it's still a huge problem, and it's supposedly gotten worse during the pandemic, is what I've been told. Yeah, I imagine because people are stuck at home and nothing to do. I imagine a lot of things that worse, you know, we don't even think about like domestic violence when you think about uh, the pandemic. You know, you, you got think about a, a, a household where a woman or a man, whoever, I mean, it's, not, it's usually the man doing it, but it happens the, the other way around, too. But if there's a domestic situation where you have like a, a, a beatings or verbal abuse, when the real world was still going, at least they're going to work, you're going to work, you get that separation, then the pandemic hit, and now you're locked in with your tormentor. Right. Uh, I, I imagine it had the suicide rate probably went through the roof. Right. Yeah. I'm Everyone's... sure <laughs> Yeah, I didn't support the lockdowns at all. I thought that was the wrong move. Say that again? I said I didn't support the lockdowns. I thought that was the wrong move for the politicians in various states. To... Thank you both. That's why I'm so happy to live in Florida. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, and who knows? It could happen again now because the monkeypox, and then who knows what's going to be the, the <laughs> next big thing. It's going to be something. Yep. I, you know, I've I've worked from home ever since coming home from uh from from prison in 2015. Um, so for me, it wasn't a, wasn't a big deal, but it, it was it was a big deal to not be able to go to a restaurant or not be able to walk into a store and have to wear a diaper on my face everywhere I went. You know, that was that was a little bit tough. But I would say things have gotten better. You know, it's it's just taken it's gonna take a long time to regroup back to that. Right. right. So what do you do? Like, what's your day to day like right now? Do you are, are do you work or are you just like more like uh like helping people? What is it? What does it look like? Well, I'm, I've been a real estate agent for thirty five years. It's kind of been my primary money making profession, and um, so I do that. And of course, you have a lot of extra time when you're doing real estate because you kind of make your own day. I'm also working on a book. It's a more of an academic book on um, animal advocacy, um, where I talk about moving from a democracy to what I call an omniocracy, which is a government with representation for all living beings. And I just finished a screenplay that's also an anti-animal cruelty screenplay, but it's very mainstream. So those are kind of my projects, in addition to now you know doing interviews regarding the documentary and still talking to victims i mean you wouldn't even believe all the emails and messages and i mean a lot of them are just really sweet and saying really sweet things but there are also a lot of them saying oh please help me and a lot of the requests have nothing to do with revenge porn and these people are saying you know my husband's getting out of jail help me i need to get my kids back help me my mother was abducted and taken to new york please help i mean you wouldn't believe some of the stories and I'm like, I wonder why they think I can solve all these problems. It's like, ah, I have no expertise in these areas. Well, you're not very hard to contact, obviously. Uh, <laughs> you know, people reach out to you, and it's, you know, you're, you're going to need a team of, uh, of filters to make sure that, because that's the problem, is you spread yourself too thin. Yeah. And you start, you know, you want to help everybody, but not everybody, it's not that they're not deserving of the help, but the people that need it the most may not get to you because you're exactly. too busy telling it's somebody. It's really hard because I've been so overwhelmed. I mean, it's like I can barely read everything, let alone start calling and trying to solve problems because it's like I'm trying to keep up with reading all the messages. <laughs> hey, so how would you say prior, so prior to the Netflix documentary, after the Netflix documentary, is it like a 20% jump in your activity or is it like a 300% jump in your activity? It's like a 300% jump. I mean, it's, it's huge because I, you know, I'm getting requests from media, plus I'm getting all this fan mail, which I didn't get before. You know, I mean, I got it way back in like 2013. I got contacted by people, but it had kind of stopped, you know. So ever since this documentary came out, I'm getting like inundated, which is great. I love getting it. I mean, it's so sweet and people are saying the nicest things and I really appreciate it. And so I have to go through all that, which is fine. And then also try to earn a living because I'm not a wealthy person, so I have to try to do that. And then I'm also trying to work on these book projects, you know, the book and the screenplay. So, yeah, so it's like juggling a lot of things. But my life has always been about juggling lots of things. So I sure I'm sure a lot of people out there that just you know assume things and don't know how things work. How much money did Netflix pay you? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to tell you, but they okay. did pay me something. Yeah, okay. I think I'll decline. 
But um, the point is, it's not. It wasn't it's, a ton, it's, though. It's, it's, but not, I did it's not like life changing money that's going to. No, it was not life changing money. That was the point. I, 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 and I, I did I, a heck of a lot of work for that documentary. I had yeah. to, you know, dig up like all these emails and all this paperwork. I had to go through my huge Hunter more files, of which, you know, I have the 12 inch file, plus I have some other file, and go through things and make copies of everything for them and send them things. And, I had to call tons of victims. You wouldn't believe I called like every single victim practically that I could get in touch with to see if they wanted to be in the documentary. And it's very hard to get revenge porn victims to come forward. So, you know, like 99% of them said no, you know, because they're so scared their pictures are going to resurface. But I did a lot of that work. And it was, it was very, it was time consuming. It was definitely, I didn't get paid enough for all the work I did for that documentary. That's for sure. Yeah, documentaries, the people that don't know, like they, they, they don't pay what you would think they would pay. Yeah. Um, and then after taxes and everything else, it's, you know, yeah. it's not much different than a month's salary in, 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 in a decent income type of a job. Um, so watching the documentary, you know, we got to see a little bit of the the back and forth between, you know, when it, when it first happened to your daughter, she came to you, didn't want to tell your, your husband at the time. Um, did that create any stress on the relationship when, when once you finally did tell him, and was he worried about the retaliation of what would happen? Like, because I know there's a point where he thought you guys should just stop, but you kept moving forward. Yeah, he thought we should stop at the very beginning when he first found out about it. I mean, it was a very tense and a lot of turmoil in the family, and my husband was actually really angry most of the time. My daughter was withdrawn and just kind of locking herself in a her room and just didn't want to face the world. And I was just like obsessed with finding out information and trying to figure out what angle and how I could possibly get her picture down and then other people's pictures down. Plus, I was talking on the phone all the time. And I had, you know, there were things that were not in the documentary. And like, for example, one of the victims was from Iran. And, from where? you know, from Iran, I-R-A-N. Right. And so, and when her picture, her topless picture went up, Hunter's followers were saying things like, I hope she gets stoned to death. And she was really freaked out because her father wanted her to go back to Iran to visit relatives. And she said, I could be killed there. I could be arrested and put in jail and killed for a topless picture in that country. So she was desperate to get it down. But she was not like your typical victim. She was very strong and capable. And so she was like my right-hand person. Even though she wasn't sitting in my house, we were on the phone all day long. And she was getting all sorts of information. And she was reaching out to victims. And she was helping me a lot. So... You know, she wasn't in because she refused to be in the documentary and they didn't want to put her in unless she was actually going to be in. They didn't want to mention her. So, but I had a stalker at my house. That was not in the documentary. A what? A stalker came wow. to my house. I went undercover at a club to try to, to help a victim serve legal papers to Hunter. And I wore this crazy getup with, you know, like this white, you know, like. But I know you got a picture of that somewhere. Let's, let's pop it up. Yeah, it was on my, I just put it on my Twitter. I mean, I look ridiculous. And you know what's really ridiculous is the people were so like wasted and drugged out apparently at this event. Two guys tried to pick me up. And I was like, first of all, you're too young for me. You're like, you know, you're old enough to be my son. <laughs> and secondly, are you crazy? I'm ugly. Do you see what I was like? It was really weird. There weren't that many people at the event, but there were like really wasted people there, I think. Yeah, I imagine there must have been quite a bit of footage that didn't make it to the make it to the documentary, the final. Yeah, part. there were a lot of things that were left out. I think they just didn't have enough time and they wanted yeah. to keep it short and keep it moving. You know, I wish they would have did once a week release of an episode instead of at once. Um, because just like anything, and when it ends, it ends and it and if it the so it, it kind of talks about like the interviews I did with Hunter after I after I found out what I know now um, that the details were pretty way more accurate than Hunter let on. I was like, fuck, I should have did this interview with him. It brought awareness to it, or it brought it kind of gave him a relevant uh, platform. But at the same time, I think it kind of really shows people that he hasn't changed, that he is still the same mentality, and he's he's not willing to. I, I, I still think there is more to Hunter than what he's releasing, um, because in this ne it's either the next clip or the next clip. It's one of these two clips. You're going to see him kind of snap a little bit and say some things that that are just so evident of who Hunter is. And let's let's see if it's the next one. I don't remember which one we just played here. I think it was. Let's go with five. I think it might be five. Well, here's the 
thing. You kind of have to go back in time. There's like a greater context to all this stuff. First of all, I don't even know my co-defendant. And they could, like I told you before. It's not me. It's parts of me. You got to understand, it was, a, it was a company email. So I had multiple people, five, six, seven people on that email address. It didn't matter. They they all wanted, they just wanted me to make an example of me. Now, we could go real deep into the hacking stuff, even though it's pretty shallow. Uh, um, do I regret that? Which is probably what you're headed towards. Yeah, I'm trying to, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, dude. I mean, it is it is what it is, but like, I don't, I don't know. It's just like, it's kind of null and void to me, like in the long run, like, Oh my God, you were so fucking affected by your busted ass titties being put on the internet that 10 years, 12 years later, you go, don't wear a bra on a Netflix documentary. Get the fuck out of here, dude. This shit is so fucking stupid. Your mom writes a book about it. I'm just, I'm just so done. It's so fucking annoying. I'm sorry. Can we move on? Like, what else do you want me to do? That kid that hacked her was some guy that was obsessed with her. Like, I have nothing. I don't know these people. I don't. I... Wow. There's a lot of lies in that one. Yeah, but you see, you see the uh, how he's not able to contain himself, and I think this is why he won't go on an interview. Because any anybody that's going to interview him, that knows, that's read the indictment, they're not just going to say, "Well, I get you're saying you didn't know the guy, but what about these three thousand strings of emails here, where you're telling the guy I'm sending you money through PayPal, I'm sending you money through wire transfer, go hack more." I mean. I don't think there's a defense against that unless you're going to play insanity or say, oh, it wasn't me. It was some idiot employee who was six years old sitting on my computer. Okay. Where does he go with that stuff? And it clearly he's talking about you with the book and the mom writing the book. Um, yeah, my daughter was actually very offended by that comment because she heard that comment and she was wearing a bra and she can't believe he claimed that she wasn't wearing a bra. So it's like she was very offended by that particular comment that he made. Just FYI. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I thought that was really insulting, and it was, you know, I don't know what to say. I've got about two hours left of, of footage that I haven't even released yet from Hunter. That was the, the first video. was part one. Um, we never released part two or part three. We went from part one to a live interview on the next one. But there's he talks about prison experience and all of this stuff, and I'm, I'm like, what, what the fuck do I do with this stuff? Because... Now what it, I know what I know now, it's like I don't even think it's value worth putting it out there. But uh, Hunter, do you? How many women out there, women, men alike, whether it was through Hunter directly or other um, other websites similar? Like you said, there's like 300 of them still up. How many people 3, do you think? 3,000. I'm sorry. How many of these individuals do you think attempted suicide, and how many individuals do you think have actually committed suicide over this? Because we saw one in the Netflix documentary that attempted. Right. I don't know how many. Um, I know that I talked to, um, you know, um, Audrey Potts' parents and Retta Parsons' parents, and they were they were not on Hunter's site. They were um, on other, you know, their pictures were distributed differently. One was from uh, Northern California and the other was from Canada. And they were both raped and, you know, sexually assaulted by multiple guys. These were different, completely different stories. And they, it was horrible. It was devastating. But they were going to live through it until the new pictures surfaced and that's when they killed themselves both of them and their parents will tell you as they told me that revenge porn for them was worse than rape because that's what drove their kids to suicide so i know there are people i've read about various people who killed themselves but i don't know any statistics yeah and now with like in the way schools i mean everybody's on social media facebook instagram twitter snapchat all these things it's it's you know, the bullying doesn't stop at the classroom. It's it's the bullying takes you're in your bedroom at night where you feel safe and you're reading, you know, a Twitter, a tweet about yourself or a Snapchat that just went viral with every kid in your school. You know, maybe you farted and got caught on camera or you got caught picking your nose and it's on everyone's phone. I mean, I can't imagine the amount of stress and anxiety that must be going on with with uh, elementary school all the way through high school. Yeah, I mean, it was bad enough when I was a kid and... <laughs> I can't imagine it either. You're right. I mean, you know, there was bullying in school, but we didn't even have the internet. So. Right. No, you know, getting off the bus and walking home was like you—you you had that moment to kind of say, "Oh, I'm safe." 
you know, there's, there's no safety anymore for, uh, for, for individuals. It's just like what Amanda just said, they're, they're nonstop attacks. It's just a full on assault. So suicide, and then the amount of drugs that are being pumped out, you know, to kind of numb kids from feeling, you know, I don't know what else, I, I'm not an advocate of, of drugging up a kid on these pills, but some of these kids, I don't know if they can handle these kind of feelings of emotions without numbing themselves out a little bit. Then you get these kind of zombie adults that don't know how to function in the real world because they've lived the whole life of just shutting their brain down. Um, what? So once all this kind of clears out and calms down and you're not getting six billion messages a second, uh, <laughs> what do you what do you want to center your focus on where you want to like divert 80 percent of your energy and power towards? Well, I mean, I, you know, I believe that other centrism is the key to happiness. So in other words, helping others, humans and animals. So I always want to be working for a cause. You know, I started with the civil rights movement, then gay rights, animal rights, and now women's rights with this. And so I'm always going to be involved in causes. And as far as success, I believe persistence is the key to success. So, you know, I have various projects I want to work on, and I mentioned a couple of them. Um, I have another book I want to write after this book that I'm working on now. And, you know, so I have different projects that I'm very interested in in the future. But I really want to, you know, try to do positive things for society and, you know, elicit change. So tell us a little bit about uh, CCRI, the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative that you're part of. Um, let's bring it up on the screen here. Well, uh, I'm actually not, I'm not part of it anymore. I used to be on the board, but I'm not anymore. I haven't been for several years, at least three or four years. But it's a wonderful organization, and there's a hotline. So if victims need assistance and want to talk to a person, then they can call. There's a lot of information on their website. And, um, and then also there's another organization that's kind of closely tied called the Cyber Civil Rights Legal Project. And those are attorneys all over the country who will help victims pro bono. So um, if you need an attorney and you you know have a case and you want to move it forward and you don't have any money to do that, you might want to do a Google search with them, their name and look up that organization. So um, they're really, really great organizations to um, try to combat this particular issue. And just so everybody knows, uh, just like all the, I, I don't know if you knew this, but all of the, um, let me go back, sorry. All of the other videos that I did with Hunter, uh, we were all of that money is being actually we were donating it to this already. I don't know if Amanda told you that she spoke to you, um, but including this video as as you know we agreed when you sent me a message, which we were going to do anyway. Any proceeds that come in from donations, tips, um, 100% will go to this. And when YouTube sends the money over, we'll do a quick little video of you know whether it's a couple hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, whatever comes in. You know it goes to a good cause. It's helping people that. Because there's there's not a lot of extensive help out there, you know. Right. There's help lines. You call somebody, they're kind of like, well, you know, you might want to call your local state this, and then you call this person. Well, you, it kind of sends you in a million different directions, and you end up spinning your wheels. So, being able to give somebody active ways to problem or active solutions to the problem to where it's not going to send them in a million different directions to get the help, I think that's kind of important because. Even like when somebody gets out of prison, you know, they go into a federal halfway house and they're trying to do the right thing and they go to get assistance and it's like, oh, you got to go here to get this and you got to go there to get this. And meanwhile, this person's been locked up for 20 years right. and everything's chaotic to them, you know, so giving some structure. I think mm -hmm. that's kind of what you've been providing for people is uh, at the very least peace of mind. I've been trying. <laughs> a one day at a time type of a thing. It doesn't happen yeah. overnight. Yeah. Uh, so you, you have a website, right? Um, I have a bunch of websites. I have a couple of, um, my books have websites, and then I have a main website, which is charlottelaws.com, but I also have a couple of other sites. Like, I have a site with my articles on it, which is, I think, charlottelaws.org, and um, I, my two memoirs, one is called Undercover Debutante, and so it's undercoverdebutante.com, and the other one is Rebel in High Heels, and that's rebelinhighheels.com, and that, um, the memoirs, the first memoir, the Rebel in High Heels memoir, is the one that also contains this revenge porn story. But both of them have lots of party crashing and lots of fun and crazy lots, things lots in my life and my horrible childhood and finding my birth parents and all this stuff is covered in my memoir. Well, you know, I, I want to bring you back on in a couple of weeks because you talked a lot about animals. And it seems like you've got a strong passion for animals, um, as we do as well in my household. Animals are 
I'll get teared up talking about it because we lost one of them. But we, we're creating, a, I'm sure you're familiar with like TED Talks. Um, uh, my, my dog's name is Ted. And we were creating like a little joke and we're calling it Ted Barks. And we're interviewing people that have uh, stories associated to their well-being because of their pets. Like we have a lady that like, lost her leg and if it wasn't for a dog, she doesn't think she would have made it through. And stories that are kind of overcoming uh, adversity tied into their pets. So you might be a good person to maybe brainstorm that with and see if, you know, maybe you've got some cool story that you want to share. <laughs> yeah, it's, we're calling it Ted Barks, and we're getting everything set up now, an organization, and here locally in the area, uh, once a month, we, we find a pet, <clears throat> we find a pet owner that has issues with their pet that it needs, like, life-saving type veterinarian care, and we try to facilitate that. So maybe okay. that's something that, uh, you know, we can tie in with you and see what you got going on. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right, uh, Charlotte, I appreciate you coming on and sharing today. I know you kind of didn't know what to expect, um, but yeah, uh, I appreciate it. You're doing a lot of good work out there, and, and it's it's a struggle. It's uphill. Uh, it's probably more hard than it is easy. So I hope the rest of your day is pleasant. I hope you have no more vandalism at your house. I hope your daughter heals from all of this, and I apologize for any grief that the Hunter video caused your family. Well, thank you, and thanks again for having me. All right, guys, I'm RDF Dan, Federal Prison Time Consulting. Keep up and people, communities, methods, one day at a time. Stay safe, everybody. I'm out of here. Good night.